Welcome to Kasna's webinar on Anthos. Uh, I'm Simon Poulton, CEO of Kasna. I'm Troy Bibby, uh, CTO at Kasna. Uh, today we're going to be talking a bit about Anthos, um, and I think you know there's there's been probably quite a bit of theoretical um, and, and even some technical demos around Anthos in the market. But what we wanted to do today was, I guess, unpack Anthos a little bit from a financial services perspective. And then rather than look at some some theoretical things, actually show some practical use case demos of several different ways that um, financial services organisations could actually draw value from Anthos. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so just before we do, you know, you've got to have some statistics, otherwise things are just not credible without statistics, Troy. So um, the ones we've got here are really largely around modernization. Um, and what you can see, you know, the, the first stat there around 90% um, of people or nine out of 10 people, uh, uh, enterprises rather, uh, in a hybrid or multi-cloud environment. Uh, I think that's quite an important stat. In fact, probably more like 10 out of 10 of the people that would attend a webinar like this are probably already working in a hybrid or multi-cloud world. Um, I would counterbalance that stat though against the last stat that 75% of all workloads are still on-prem. So while we've got this you know, aspiration, I guess, to modernize, we're, we're only part of the way there. A um, couple of the other stats I think are important. Um, you know, it's a majority of people now, so over 59%, um, of enterprises out there actually want to modernize rather than just lift and shift to the cloud. They want to extract greater value out of the cloud than just rebuilding their data center in the cloud. Um, and the other thing I think which is aspirational but important is that 87% of orgs um, want, to, want to be running containers, right? Not necessarily for every workload, um, but for the ones that they've got to deliver business value on and deliver well at scale. Um, that's kind of a, a key thing. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the, the next thing really is to talk a bit about the strategy. So now that we've, you know, we're talking about everyone who's modernizing, how do you get there? And I guess the first point, and we've, we've used this kind of quadrant view before on our, on our vlog between two clouds, um, the bottom left corner is where 75% of workloads are based on that last statistic, which is, you know, legacy environment, probably on a VMware environment, if not physical tin, um, proprietary closed hardware and apps. Um, going from that quadrant there to the top right quadrant, which is the target quadrant we're talking about of cloud native in the cloud, where we've got, you know, shifting our CapEx spend into OpEx, and we're doing that in a way which is consistently reducing the, the amount of OpEx required and takes advantage of the scalability of the cloud. Um, jumping from that bottom left quadrant to the top right quadrant, um, she's not so easy, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah and we find a lot of uh, customers um, uh, in the past as well have, have been burnt a little bit by cloud because they simply took these old workloads and tried to shift them straight into the cloud, didn't see the benefit, right? And, and that's a, continu a, a, a common theme that we hear as well. So they want to modernize. They think that they all they have to do is throw stuff into the tin into the cloud and, and not do any, any, any other work. Yeah, and I guess that's your bottom right quadrant, mm -hmm. right, which is kind of AWS yeah. or Microsoft Azure, which is a traditional lift and shift. Um, the really important one for today, I think we're going to talk about probably two, and one is, I guess, going from AWS and Azure into into Google or balancing out some of that from a multi-cloud perspective. The other one is going kind of, I guess, from your legacy on-prem and rather than trying to jump straight into a, a cloud native stack, actually applying some of those cloud native capabilities on-prem and getting comfortable with those as an organization and then being able to migrate them directly into the cloud. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of a key differentiator of Anthos is being able to provide that kind of modernization on-prem strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Um, so next question to ask is, you know, why Anthos in Australian financial services? Um, I guess one of the things we've talked about a bit before in, in our vlog um, is about multi-cloud and poly-cloud and why that's important. You know, what are the reasons um, that someone would adopt more than one cloud vendor? So Troy, maybe you could uh, unpack that a bit for us. Uh, yeah, so I mean, we were finding um, in financial services, certainly, that uh, you can have a, a front end usually up in the cloud or using some services uh, for data potential in the cloud, but you've always got a dependency usually back on on-prem data centers. And in more and more cases these days, it's with multi-cloud as well. Uh, there's APRA uh, um, uh, pressures as well to ensure that you're not locked into a single vendor. And we've seen a lot of mul uh, other cloud vendors out there that um, have regional or even global outages, you know, for for 
not meeting their SLIs, uh, and that's happened pretty consistently almost every year. So not being able to, to spread that risk as well as manage the risk of multiple clouds or on-prem and cloud is uh, is a real challenge. Yeah, and you can see that reflected in uh, Jim Carrey's horribly <laughs> worried face balanced against the uh, the running of the bank here. Yep. I guess the other thing we've talked a bit about before is um, – multi-cloud from a negotiation perspective as well so uh, i think the analogy i was using was buying bananas mm -hmm. if you only have one place to buy your bananas and the price of bananas goes up that becomes a very uh, expensive food habit mm -hmm. to eat bananas whereas if you can get bananas from a few different places then uh you know you can kind of balance that out a that's right and how do you make sure that you know your banana salesman's got like the best newest bananas you know just Shiny the bananas, the bananas yeah. you need for the future in order to grow your business you know yeah. and you know Things like data and AI and uh, and ML are super important uh, for moving those legacy business processes into AI. And what's the best way to do that? Yeah, that's a good point. I think we've definitely talked about the poly cloud angle before mm -hmm. as well of actually trying to get the go deep into many clouds instead of actually try and be equivalent across all of them. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a good way to kind of develop a strategy around extracting the best value from each cloud provider. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Uh, right, so what are the three main things, I guess we're talking about the three main features or functions um, from, from an Anthos perspective. The first one I guess I talked about already, that, that modernise in place strategy, so giving you a way to actually take on the tools and processes and ways of working that are required for a cloud native stack, but maybe without actually putting those things in the cloud yet. And actually, the other thing that allows you to do is to maximize um, the return on investment from that, that hardware that you've already bought on-prem. Maybe you've got another three years to go before that thing's um, burnt down to the floor. So yeah, that, that aspect of modernizing place, definitely a, a key one. And I think also with that is like if you don't modernize now in those three years, mm -hmm. let's say it's a very big workload, especially in financial services, a core app, mm -hmm. you know you want to get to the cloud, but if you just sit on your hands for three years on-prem and by the time that goes into life, you then have to you know, scramble to try and replace that or then take advantage of cloud. So modernizing on place, on, in place uh, on-prem makes a lot of sense. Perfect. The second one I think is also really important, um, especially from financial services, which is um, automate policy and security at scale. Um, you know, obviously the risk thing we were talking about before, um, you know, one of the key aspects of banking is probably around risk and managing risk. If you create a control, understanding that that control, which is meant to balance out that risk, where it's applied and ensuring that it's applied everywhere it needs to be that's kind of i guess a key concern that consumes a lot of man hours and a lot of sleepless nights for, for people in banking and financial services in general yeah that's the nirvana really for this is to define a control by uh, your security or your risk teams and have that translated into uh different platforms that are serving um serving the, the the rest of that workload and when it becomes on-prem or multi-cloud then having that same uh same control then get translated into uh multi-cloud or on-prem is is very challenging but it is something that anthos addresses and that's that's what we'll be demoing a little bit today yeah i guess the last one consistency and I, I guess you can see this in a lot of different aspects of anthos but wherever you run um a workload not just the kind of um consistency of how the workload runs but how things are applied to that workload what the developer experience is like all of those things just balancing out some of that consistency i guess to partly to maximize the efficiency of the software delivery tool mm -hmm. chain right yep, yep. yeah Cool. So um, maybe you can talk a little bit about the different types of environments that Anthos would, would typically manage. Yeah. So um, uh, Google's uh, really the big the big announcement was back in uh, uh, 2019, uh, but they're continuing to to expand uh, Anthos and and its coverage, and it now covers multi cloud. So Azure, AWS, um, and uh, they originally brought up for VMware on prem. And uh, and all based around you know the Kubernetes stack and the and the modern uh, 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 software uh, delivery stack of Kubernetes, mm -hmm. uh, and it's really you know build once and run it anywhere. So we we had that with Java, I guess, which was the Java virtual machine. But again, it was just a single machine, right? And this really is you know uh, building a cloud that will run anywhere, uh, and it's open standard. And yeah, we'll we'll go into a, a bit more of that. Perfect. Yep. 
So why don't you take us through a bit of the um, the, the history that, that got us here? Yeah, so um, just as a matter of introduction, um, we'll go into a bit of the background of where Anthos came from and what uh, 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 and how it sort of evolved and uh, and the reasons why we have uh, modern software stacks and, and Anthos today. So first off, I want to talk about C groups and don't worry too much about what that actually means. Uh, a lot of people think maybe it was container uh, groups, but at any rate, Google has been running containers or a version of containers for about 15 years. And in 2006, they open sourced uh, C groups and it got brought into the Linux main uh, mainline kernel in, in 2008. And that was fully open sourced and was a way of getting away from the Java virtual machines or the VM uh, way of thinking uh, and moving uh, that processing uh, to small, discrete compute elements that could be shipped around. And talking about shipping around, uh, next came Docker, and Docker was a, a tool chain, set of tools that uh, that leveraged C groups and sort of then uh, uh, facilitated this microservice architecture, uh, which really exploded on the scene. And uh, it allowed you to decouple your business logic, get fe features out much faster, and have portability between uh, different platforms by using uh, 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 Docker containers. And I, I guess the challenge at this point, Troy, started to become around orchestration and managing lots of different containers. Correct, yeah. So it was great on a de developer laptop, and then once they, once you realize you started having, you know, maybe 50, maybe 100 uh, microservices, uh, availability, observability became a, a real challenge. And uh, so that's... Um, um, that, that evolved into Kubernetes, but before we go into that, let's talk about the VMs and the shared differences between the shared hosts. So containerized, again, as I said, uh, isolated, uh, uh, it gives you common libs and they're quite small. Uh, and that's compared to your traditional, uh, more legacy cloud players, I would say, in, in, that you see uh, uh, sort of dominating the market today, which would be AWS and Azure, which are really much more about their virtual machines. Mm -hmm. Uh, and these sort of large operating systems, you know, 99% have nothing to do with your workload. So if you think about that from disk to network to storage, all of these, 99% of that doesn't actually service your customers, particularly with VMs. So from just a raw cost and management point of, point of view, yeah, containers is really a no-brainer. So um, the, next, um, the, the next thing as you mentioned was, you know, how do you start managing these containers at scale? Uh, and that's really where in, uh, Kubernetes came out. So uh, Google, as I said, had been managing containers for 15 years um, and brought out C groups, so they've already understood it quite well. And they had a system called Borg that, that managed all these containers for 15 years. And they rewrote Borg and took all the best parts and put that into a, a project called Kubernetes, which is then open sourced fully and released the trademark even to, to a uh, foundation. And uh, that now is the default, uh, uh, it, it is the, I guess, the winner in the orchestration wars as the, as the containerized uh, orchestration and management uh, platform, portable container orchestration. We then talk about a, on top of that then, now that you have containers, you wanna be able to add on things like uh, networking uh, and and observability and security around these uh, uh, and policy around these uh, um, uh, containers as they're running across multiple nodes and and potentially even as we'll see with Anthos across multiple uh, clouds and that's where ser the service mesh comes in and that's to, uh, today Istio is a very popular one of those and, and we'll talk more about that later uh, and then the very top is you know use serverless which is k-native again an open source modernized platform. Uh, that is completely, um, uh, you know, abstracts the developer and the workload from the underlying compute and is really sort of the nirvana to get to for your stateless uh, uh, code. Mm -hmm. So um, why Anthos over any other type of software do you think? Um, uh, I think that the reason we're really excited about it is because it is 100% 100% software-based solution, so you're not tied into any vendor. And for, for FSI, this makes a, a huge amount of, uh, of sense, right? They're not going to tie too much into uh, OpenShift or particular software stacks uh, that have dependencies on hardware like HP or VMware 
uh, where they have to rotate the, their hardware and then they have to rotate their software on top of that. So Anthos is 100% software based. It's Google um, managed uh, versions of Kubernetes. It's the service mesh, which is again, open sourced um, by uh, Google. Uh, it's a marketplace of you know uh, hundreds of, of off the shelf uh, products that you can uh, stick straight in. And, uh, and key is also config management. So that's policy at scale being applied across multi-cloud and on-prem. Uh, so in the demos, we're gonna go through all of the core components of Anthos, and those are gonna be shown here. And I won't go into these too much uh, now, but these are the core components. You've got your container management at the bottom there. So GKE we'll refer to as the Google Kubernetes engine. That's gonna be the Kubernetes that's fully managed. They do all the upgrades and management for you. The mesh is on top of that, again, providing a network layer. And then on top of that is your, your marketplace and your cloud run native uh, run stacks. And then on either side is your operational, you know, stack driver, your visit, uh, observability and uh, policy management applying your security controls. And I guess before we just chip into some use cases, um, mm -hmm. one thing to say from the very bottom up, you know, um, that, that Google flavor of GK is already a kind of gold plated standard right oh yeah um, above the other kubernetes flavors that are out there yeah right? definitely yeah, gke is a uh is the gold standard for running uh kubernetes uh, efficiently cost effective without give it, still allowing you to to tweak all the uh the knobs and uh, and have all the bells and whistles but all the upgrade the overhead of management of the software on top of the compute is is managed by Google. So okay, perfect. So I think we're gonna Let's move go. to some use cases sure. now. Yeah. So Troy, tell me a little bit about our friend Con. Yeah. So Con is head of a development of a new neo bank. They've, mm -hmm. they've come out recently. They're they're really cloud native, or they started in the cloud. No on prem really infrastructure. But what they have a need for is uh, that uh, is to push uh, new features and code quickly, uh, consistently. Uh, and securely, obviously, being you know uh, required to be app or regulated. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that Con's having issues with is is uh, the complexity and the security around managing all of this cloud cloud native infrastructure and containers. And um, what we're going to talk about today or show today in this use case is how Anthos potentially can help provide that single control plane across his uh, Kubernetes infrastructure and can. Um, get his development team doing more development and a lot less infrastructure management. Focusing on that feature development yeah. rather than managing stacks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So let's talk a little bit about more of a, about his problem. So in this case, we saw in, in the previous uh, video how um, uh, 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 teams can go for, that are already cloud native can move to Anthos, which is a centralized control plane uh, to, de to uh, I guess, de- uh, uh, risk uh, the security around his Kubernetes infrastructure, um, as well as just the, the general management of Kubernetes and, and services. And um, so we're moving from that top left quadrant to that, to that right. And we'll be covering these core components, which are service mesh um, and container management. So the container management, as we said before, was that orchestration layer. Uh, and in Google land, it's called GKE, which is Google Kubernetes Engine. And it's that fully managed um, GKE, best of class, to, to run Kubernetes at scale, but not have the overheads of upgrades and and cluster management, and Google handles all of that for you, as well as the security. And then we'll also be talking about the service mesh, and that service mesh, again, is the um, services layer or network services layer that handles interactions between containers and workloads and secures them. And I guess that can get quite complex when you're talking perhaps hundreds or thousands of microservices. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Perfect. Okay, so let's see if this demo will work. Okay, we have sacrificed have many a frozen chicken. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. To the demo gods. That's right. Uh, I'll just get that up. So what we're going to be looking at here is the the Anthos service mesh. So that's that core part on top of GKE um, that we're uh, uh, that we're going to be looking at. And in this case, we are running a a workload here in our dashboard. This is the Anthos dashboard. So we have two clusters uh, that are connected in. We'll, we'll be concentrating to have a lot more. Those are for, for later demos. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can see our cluster status here, which is giving us a quick view of just that GKE infrastructure, what it looks like. And then the service mesh is built on top. We can drill into the service mesh now and have a look at uh, the, 
the, the applications I have running on my service mesh. Uh, so we can see all of those here. Um, they currently don't have SLO or SLIs, I'll, and I'll talk about those in a second. We want to drill into one of our services here. Let's call it the front end. This is our front end for this particular app, this banking app um, for his NeoBank, for Khan's NeoBank. And uh, what we want to do is see where that front end service actually sits. So let's go to the topology mm -hmm. and the service mesh provides you that view very quick about your front end service and all the underlying microservices that are also sitting out. And it gives you the dashboard on uh, QPS, the, the uh, service availability targets that you've, you've set. So we can look at this one and actually go to the service dashboard for any of these services. So once you start running hundreds and even thousands of microservices, it becomes very difficult. So all this dependency mapping is all being done within the service mesh. So I can view now um, SLO, SLIs. So which can, are, can you yeah. just define SLO and SLI? SLO is an SLI is a service level indicator. So that's mm -hmm. something like CPU or that's something like uh, response per second. And that is something that could indicate a problem or indicate an issue. Uh, and SLO is an objective or a service level objective. And that is to say, I want 99% availability for my front end service, let's say. So that's the objective and you can guarantee that by adding SLIs against that. Okay, perfect. So the uh, Anthos service mesh allows you to set all of those and you can hit those uh, through this service dashboard for any of those services and then roll those up into your overall business service. Um, so we can look at the health. Um, again, uh, this is, didn't, um, and it says we're out of our error budget because we've had 26% over our error budget, which are our target of 99 uh, for a latency. Uh, but what we can do is at a service level, which is our front end, we could be, well, we are running across multiple clusters. And so we get a view of the infrastructure, regardless of the, um, how many clusters or where that cluster is. Uh, we can also look at those connected services, look at the inbound and outbound through lines. We can see all those backends that are, are currently connect, uh, need to be connected. Mm -hmm. And we can drill into diagnostics, so pulling logs from multiple clusters and have all those together. And we can drill in uh, very quickly and understand what's uh, what potentially could be a problem with our service. And obviously, if we we're doing this as a developer day in, day out without Anthos, that's a lot of manual work. That's a lot of manual work. Together. That's a lot of tooling for, for Khan's dev team mm -hmm. that they don't really have time to do or spend. And uh, then you get this sort of uh, mixed mode where you have developers trying to push out features, but then constantly having to fix and debug problems in the infrastructure layer. And that's really where Anthos uh, is, is looking to help out. Mm -hmm. um, so again, yeah, doing traffic view, and then there's the security view, which we'll look further. So the service mesh is giving us observability. That's where we're getting all those metrics and pulling out the SLIs and SLOs, the business services. But it'll also do security of the, the individual services here. So we can see that this, uh, uh, that we've got a, a workload uh, on our front end here, which are two um, services, uh, mainly online boutique. And what we're going to want to do is change that from plain text, which it says here, and turn that directly into um, uh, uh, MTLS or, or secured traffic between services. We can do that easily um, using Istio. And the difference with Anthos is that that is now going to be cross cluster. So we can run our Istio mesh cross cluster with, with Anthos using Anthos Configuration Manager, which we'll drill into a lot more in that, the, the next video. But for now, we're just going to secure this uh, by making a change in our Git. And, and the other thing that Anthos is using is uh, GitOps or, or Git based configuration management. And so if we look at our uh, repo here, we can see that there's uh, uh, a bunch of things that are defining what the Anthos clusters will run as. And one of those will be uh, to secure this Istio communication that's happening between uh, the front end and the rest of its services. So all we need to do is, you know, with our GitOps is we make that change. We can have a look Yet we're changing both our mesh policy here and our destination rule. We're now going to just uh, commit that. I'm going to call it uh, secure TLS front end. And then we push that. And this is going to go up and automatically change our, uh, yeah, there we go. So that's gone up into Git. And now what will happen is Anthos, those Anthos clusters connected will pull in that configuration and make the change automatically 
to um, uh, to the Kubernetes and Istio stacks that are running underneath those. And so if we wait a few more minutes, this will pull that up and we'll be able to see. So just while yep. we're waiting for it, maybe we should quickly also talk about that GitOps, um, GitOps. managing config as yep. code because clearly that, you know, that allows for a lot um, a lot better management of the environment, um, mm -hmm. more consistency in deployments, would you say? Definitely yep. consistency in deployments across environments as well. So you can have your dev, your test, have those policies and that configuration set for each of those environments and then manage those all through Git and the Git tooling chain that you're already using, that your developers are already using sort of natively with their with their application code. So just thinking back to Con again, you know, our, our friend Con's now got developers working much more productively mm -hmm. on, uh, on those uh, feature changes. Correct. Uh, he's getting much more secure um, development. And, uh, and I can actually see that's turning yep. green. Very that's good, Troy. That's good. That one worked out <laughs> well. Yep. Uh, now, um, yeah, so that's made that change, and that's now across those clusters, and so that traffic has now been secured, and that's all you really have to do. So, yeah, to summarize, to solve Khan's problem, he can now overlay that security inside his neobank. He can solve, he's already got his observability through the metrics that we saw that are coming out from his application, and uh, he's reduced his complexity now, so that, again, his developers aren't worried about, is my observability or, or why is my clusters um, synchronized in terms of the configuration. Okay, perfect. Very good. Yeah. So there we go. Um, and that's, yeah, that's Anthos Service Mesh and GKE. All right, use case two, Troy, with mm -hmm. uh, added caffeine uh, yep. and extra zing. Let's talk a little bit about Caroline. Yeah, so Caroline is a CIO for a large uh, fin services company uh, and already has quite a bit of um, on-prem infrastructure and has dipped a toe into uh, cloud mm -hmm. a bit. Uh, but really, her what her strategy is is to to try and find technology or or I guess software which will help her on prem prepare for the cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, but because in the past she's had uh, programs to do migrations, they were very costly and not very successful because they were trying to take basically just VMs and sticking them in the cloud and didn't they didn't they find there's a lot of cost involved security issues with trying to just simply port them over into the, to the on-prem. So she's very interested in how to modernize her applications eventually, but but start tackling that by looking at her on-prem first and then migrating workloads to the cloud. Okay, and so a great example of this is probably say, let's say someone out there who's got maybe two and a half years left of investment mm -hmm. on their VMware farm. Yeah. Um, getting to the end of that investment and then suddenly trying to dump everything in the clouds. Yeah. Not an ideal strategy as we kind of discussed mm -hmm. in the in the uh, introduction. Um, and so this gives her a way to actually leverage that same hardware investment but prepare herself and her team for that kind of journey mm -hmm. to the cloud. Yep. Okay, perfect. Yeah, right. so let's um, look a little bit more at what we'll be talking about in this demo. <laughs> Uh, so uh, looking back at our, our quadrant here for moving, what we're talking about is taking that traditional on-prem workload and uplifting it to, um, or parts of it into containerization, mm -hmm. and then having that in place on-prem so that the move to um, cloud native and to cloud uh, is much easier. So that's really what the, the quadrant there is showing. And what we'll be talking about in detail is the policy management, which is the Anthos config management. And we'll see, uh, in a moment, how that sort of ties everything together for both your on-prem and your your clusters in the cloud. Uh, so policy management is really all defined through Anthos config management, and there's four key um, points that we'll discuss uh, and capabilities we'll discuss for Anthos config management. Uh, it's really that multi-cluster, which you get across both your on-prem and, uh, and multi-cloud. Uh, it's also declarative and continuous. So uh, the whole ideal with with Kubernetes is that you declare your state. Kubernetes takes that state and then ensures that it's up to date uh, at all time. And that's uh, that's really where you get the power of Anthos config management. It uses that whole declarative continuous uh, management. Uh, hybrid support as well. So um, obviously the on-prem uh, Kubernetes clusters and your, your clusters that are living in GKE uh, or even multi-cloud, we'll see later. Um, and then simple migration. So once you're in that Kubernetes ecosystem, migrating those workloads as well as the policy and configuration is, is uh, quite easy. 
Um, so why would you be using Anthos config management um, when you could just, you know, it, how is this really a problem? Um, and if you're not around, I guess, a lot of the Kubernetes or, or um, uh, those sorts of infrastructures, you um, maybe not aware of how things can scale in terms of complexity, particularly as you have maybe initially just a single cluster, single configuration, as you start adding more and more workloads, those become much more uh, configuration heavy and um, and problematic to try and keep synchronized, particularly as you move through, through environments and promote code in t from staging to prod, et cetera. So as you start adding teams, and more and more workloads with different teams and those have different needs and different policies, that just exponentially uh, increases your problem for configuration management. And this is something that Anthos config management will help. So let's have a jump straight into the demo. And uh, here we can see a, um, uh, our Kubernetes clusters. This is in GKE interface in, in Google Cloud. And what we'll see is we've got two clusters there. Um, first one's called GCP. That's actually running in Google Cloud, and that's a GKE cluster. So that's fully managed by Google, uh, their masters, as well as the nodes for upgrades. And then we also have an on-prem cluster that's been registered into Anthos, and that one is not managed. Uh, you can see the type is there is Kubernetes, and that's running uh, on-prem VMware, uh, and then a Kubernetes cluster on top. And what we'll see with uh, Anthos config management is that we can apply cluster, uh, cluster configuration and policy against both of those clusters at the same time using the same centralized configuration resource. Um, so looking at the config repo, so. Um, Anthos Config Manager uses a GitOps model where everything is defined in uh, Git, and Git obviously, well, for for a lot of people, understand what Git is and has changed the the landscape of uh, of declarative um, infrastructure in uh, using the Git ecosystem. And what we'll see is that that's the same thing that Anthos is using, and this is the configuration that's all defined in cluster resources or cluster registry. And you can see our two clusters here. Central is our GCP and remote is our on-prem. And that defines those two clusters. And then we can have uh, cluster selectors here, which are basically tags or labels that then say what workloads can where, can run where. So we're now you know, extracting that policy from configuration that might live in the cloud or might live on-prem. And it's now centralized in a, in a central configuration repository. So simple, even I can understand it, Troy. Well, hopefully, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so Theoretically. Tell me a bit about this uh, BOA namespace down the bottom here. So BOA, yeah. So this is our workload, which is Bank of Anthos. Let's have a look at the, com, uh, the uh, Bank of Anthos here. This is the, uh, a banking app that, that Caroline has running and provides um, you know, checking account, that, that sort of history. But what we'll see once we go to workloads in here um, is this BOA namespace is spread across two different clusters. So we have our front end um, here, which we just saw, we just ran through. That's a microservice that then goes and talks to ledger writer and log uh, generator, for example. Um, but what you'll see here is that our on-prem for the balance reader, I'll just sort by this, on-prem is the ledger DB because the app regulation right now is to leave that on-prem and to run it on-prem. So she has migrated to uh, Kubernetes, but it's not currently running inside a cloud yet. So this is a workload that's spread across both on-prem and uh, into the cloud. And that's a way of her starting to move some of those workloads into cloud and take leverage of cloud, meanwhile still having an on-prem infrastructure that she can uplift. Yeah, so um, what we'll do now um, is look at that workload. Um, this is a, an example of our on-prem here. Mm -hmm. Not an example, this is running the K9s tool, but this is basically showing, showing all the workloads running. This is the config management system here. And what we can see, this is over in GCP, so this is in Google, and this is an on-prem. What we'll see is there's some pods here, uh, which are both running this Git importer system and the Git um, uh, synchronizer. There's actually three components to the Anthos config management. But this syncer will basically take a view of what's happening in, in that repo, which I just showed, and will synchronize that into the cluster and ensure that it's compliant with the, with the policy that's been defined. Uh, and that policy then interacts with the, the BOA or the Bank of Anthos and ensures that only because of the cluster selector, only stuff that's, that's 
uh, defined to run on-prem or stuff that is allowed to run in, in cloud will run using those cluster selectors. So um, now what she wants to do, we'll see as an example, is uh, she is interested in getting a new workload on. And that's going to be a new front-end shop that, uh, that uh, provides additional services on top uh, of her, uh, her existing um, the Bank of Anthos app. So what we'll do is we're going to now, using uh, those cluster selectors, we're going to deploy, uh, deploy this new app. To our two clusters. And if we go back over here now, we'll see those starting to get populated. And I see it's referred to as the hipster app. This is the hipster app. And that's getting deployed now to, to both our uh, our GCP pod and to our on-prem pod. Yeah. And those, again, are ensuring policy through Anthos config management to ensure that only the services that are meant to be over here uh, will be deployed here, and the services meant to be deployed in on-prem, uh, sorry, or into the cloud will be deployed into the cloud. So those are coming up and spinning up, and that's you know great. So that's very similar to the Bank of Anthos, and it's really that easy to ensure policy and then report back to say to Apparent through uh, the, the effect of where these workloads are running and, and the central configuration which is uh, uh, provides that central policy across those two. Now keep in mind these are also not Google, right? So these are or, or this on-prem is not Google, but it's because it's Kubernetes it can be hooked into Anthos and, and exploit that entire ecosystem. So now she's interested in um, she's got this running in both both locations, and now she, uh, you know, they've had the hipster hipster shop. Napper said, "Look, the hipster shop's fine to have because it's not actually taking any transaction. All they're doing is, you know, I don't know, using extra points from their bank account or something like that in order to buy stuff." So she's now going to move that into uh, into the cloud, and it's just as simple of again because it's all centrally managed, uh, deploying that workload and keeping that same. Um, policy in place uh, will allow uh, that control, same policies uh, applied here as they're going to get deployed now into the uh, cloud. Uh, and so those services which were here are getting now migrated into the cloud, and then this service is getting uh, removed. So you can see how that from central location, Anthos policy management, config management will also apply policy and config control across both of those clusters. Mm -hmm. So not only has Caroline been able to develop on-prem with the tools that would be associated with cloud, she's also been able to actually apply that policy consistently at scale Correct. across both on-premise and in the cloud. That's right. And so now she has a strategy uh, to apply uh, policy controls uh, through gatekeeper controls, and uh, which we didn't We'll cover later in another another demo, but apply that configuration and that and that policy control to ensure that her workloads are secured and uh, and prepared for the future you know, in, uh, to exploit cloud. Fantastic. Yeah. So Troy, use case three. Yeah. Um, let's talk a bit about Michael, who looks scarily like Mantle Group's chief operating <laughs> officer, Michael it Bodel. He does, <laughs> but uh, Michael uh, is uh, the infrastructure manager at a large uh, bank here in Australia. Mm -hmm. Um, and is responsible for the cloud pro cloud platforms. Now, uh, most of the very large FSIs have do have a, a cloud, and, but Apra's recent guidance is that uh, you have to be you remove your dependence on a single vendor. So, mm -hmm. he's got uh, he needs multi cloud capabilities uh, to meet that Apra sort of requirement, as well as remove the you know the single vendor dependence that. Um, uh, that he has, uh, but he's found often that and and. and and has been borne out by a lot of the customers that we talk to is that it's it's very complex and be quite daunting to to go for a multi-cloud uh, type of setup. Um, so he's got Kubernetes, he's got cloud native in both, but he doesn't he, he's not sure how to apply policy. Uh, they have been doing it sort of built into the each provider, but that's that's shown to be costly and and not very effective. So he's he wanted to know uh, how Anthos can potentially help him in securing those workloads. Okay, let's grab a look at the yeah. demo. Okay. So first we'll do some introductions, a few concepts here. So what we're talking about here is, is in this demo, is taking native cloud stacks, so stuff that you may already have in uh, GCP uh, or other 
uh, stacks or legacy cloud, you know, VM deployments where you just have VMs, what can you do to then move those into that top right quadrant, which is mm -hmm. uh, the cloud native uh, uh, Anthos supporting open standards. So today we'll be talking about both policy management using uh, Anthos policy controller and uh, operations management using Stackdriver and why both of those are important components of Anthos. Uh, so first off, just to to go and talk a little bit about the stack driver. So stack driver is the logging and, and observability um, uh, tool chain in or, or capability in GCP, and that is going to pull um, uh, uh, monitoring stats logs all from Kubernetes clusters running in wherever that multi-cloud environment is, and have a consolidated, aggregated place to to view all that. So you no longer have to try and tie multiple um, uh, uh, logging frameworks from the different cloud vendors, you can get that straight out of Kubernetes and put all in the same place. Um, and then policy controller we'll drill into a little bit as well. That is That provides this really strong framework using open policy agent um, as, a, uh, as an intermediary of defining a policy control using something called Rego. And that defines a policy which then gets translated and, and applied at runtime as well as you know in your in your pipelines for developing uh, and in your delivery of code and then that gets deployed into GKE or into your on-prem Kubernetes uh, or, or multi-cloud infrastructure so let's have a have a look so in this uh, in this case we've got our GKE instances we've shown here before again these clusters are here uh, and we've got um, we've got those under policy management under Anthos config management, um, and we've also got a couple other ones in here. Uh, we've also got an AWS EKS, which is Elastic Kubernetes Service, I believe, from from AWS, and that's running inside e e AWS. We'll see in a second and pushing um, metrics and and logs as well as we having uh, of us having policy enforcement uh, into that cluster, and we've got the same thing here with uh, AKS. Um, which is Azure contain, uh, Kubernetes service. And both of those are getting pushed into Anthos uh, and registered in Anthos. So let's have a look at that. This is our EKS cluster, uh, DNS demo EKS, what this one's called. Not, um, not, not a whole lot of information on it. Um, I think as far as um, Kubernetes managed Kubernetes services, yeah, AWS is a little bit behind uh, a lot of the others. Um, but um, uh, you can see that this one is here. Uh, and likewise, we've got the Azure one as well. Again, this one's in Australia East. The, the EKS version here, we've got, uh, where do I have this? Uh, US West 2 in Amazon services. So um, that uh, both of those have policy management. So what do those look like in practicality? Let's have a look at that. Um, in our demo here. Sorry. Ah, I know what I did. Sorry. <laughs> here we go. Sorry. So, yeah, here we go. We've got um, our interface for our K9's interface. So this is showing Kubernetes. And again, we've got our um, two contexts, AKS and EKS. Mm -hmm. This one, again, as we see, is in West 2, which is the AWS. And the second cluster here we've got over in uh, Australia Southeast. Now, what we'll notice, and we saw in, in the previous demo, is that this is the config management system. So this is the way of synchronizing that configuration across those clusters. Um, so it's constantly pulling that configuration source, and it's got applied, uh, you know, security around Git and that whole Git workflow, which uh, developers all would be very, um, very familiar with. And then the synchronizer service is constantly ensuring that the cluster is up to date, and that includes all of the policy that we'll see in Gatekeeper. And for those that aren't aware, what Gatekeeper is? Gatekeeper is a uh, runtime policy engine inside your Kubernetes clusters that ensures that things like workloads that have to be uh, in Australia, for example, can only be placed in that cluster. So in, in our case, what we've set up here in this Azure cluster is that only workloads 
that are allowed in Australia are allowed to run on that cluster. And, and that is that configuration policy is all done centrally in that Git uh, repo that we saw for Anthos config management. And so ordinarily, if we think about Michael as the guy running the infrastructure, they would have a different probably set of tools and frameworks in place for the different clouds that they might have. That's correct. Yeah. So yeah, they'll, they'll have to have a whole way of interacting and pulling the, the information around policy and controlling that policy. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you've got workloads running Kubernetes, you can depend on Kubernetes to simply manage that policy through Open Policy Agent and the Gatekeeper. Uh, service so it centralizes that you can you can go back to Apra and say we have multi-cloud and here is the rego policy and this is it getting applied to both EKS AWS and GK, uh, GKE and, and GCP okay perfect yeah um, and this uh, the last thing sort of to show here is our our uh, uh, connector so this GKE connect will log into the Anthos service and show that cluster in the Anthos uh, interface and that then also provides the stake stack driver so it configures the con the logging and observability from both the Istio mesh that you might have running on here and the logging from the Prometheus and and uh, metrics coming out of the Kubernetes cluster pushing those into stack driver and uh, we'll see those here if we go to our anthos dashboard we already saw a bunch of you know the service mesh previously, uh, but we can look at the cluster and look at those services registered in here. We've got our EKS demo and our Azure demo, and both of those are coming in as external types and registered. Uh, now you have to depend on EKS and you have to have tooling around EKS or Azure if you have those clusters. Uh, but the the real power for Anthos is that Anthos can also do uh, GKE for AWS. And that means you're running native GKE type of uh, upgrades and uh, services directly from AWS. So you get even more control and and um, uh, upgrades and managed uh, master nodes and things with that service.